to the Buzz Club. I am your host, Bintu Honeybee, and today you are in for a treat. We have a special, and it's called America's Most Wanted, the Black Male and Endangered Species. We are going to talk about all the issues that are plaguing our black men in America today. To my left, my first guest is Mr. Christopher McFadden. Mr. Christopher is an educator and a dean. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name is Chris, like Bintu said. I'm an educator, and I was a dean. Now I'm a teacher. I wanted to get back into the classroom. Um, my tag or what I say to people who ask me what I do in full is that I educate young people who are perceived as detriments to society and teach them how to posit positively impact their community. Thank you, Christopher. Where, what school do you teach at? I teach at Freedom Prep Charter School in Camden, New Jersey. If you, can, if you want to have a full picture of what Camden looks like, if you ever saw The Wire, it looks just like that section of Baltimore. Wow. Well, I would love to get a little bit into that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next to Christopher, we have Sharita Rooney. She is a mother, a proud mother, and also a community activist. Sharita, tell them a little bit about yourself. So again, my name is Sharita. Um, I've worked before with um, BAM, an organization by any means necessary. And what we have done in the past is work around affirmative action. Um, specifically to make sure that minorities are able to obtain um, scholarships based on their race. Something that has been um, gone throughout like um, Ohio and California, places where they've tried to stop that. So. Thank you, Sharita. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, we have Shane Witherspoon, who is also an educator and a musician. Shane, can you tell us a little about yourself? Hi, my name is Shane Witherspoon. I am a second grade social studies and science teacher at Mastery Charter Climber Campus in North Philadelphia. I'm also a musician, but I like to say activist. Um, it's like art, we like activists put together because a lot of a lot of times kids like to learn everything from music, so I just like to teach them through music. Okay. Thank you guys so much for coming. Obviously, um, you know, this has been a challenge for us for a very long time, um, and I think that it's, there's been an increase um, of public attention on what's happening with boys and young men of color in the United States of America. They're experiencing some of the highest rates in crime, unemployment, lack of education. Why do you think this is happening right uh, in our country right now? Why do you think that there's so much downhill, downhill spiral when it comes to what's happening with young black boys in America? Well, I don't think it's anything new. I think that, um, you know, if we look at the um, emergence of, let's say, and I won't get into that too much, but the criminal justice system, we look at when, after the Civil, um, after the civil War, you know, um, and 95% of um, black people were now free, there had to be some way in order to control the black body. And so, how did they do that? Um, basically, blacks were painted as criminals. That was one way. It happened is terrible, but we are so aware of it more right now because it's in our face. We're on our phones all the time. We're on, looking at the TV all the time. Back 60, I don't want to say 60, but 30 years ago, we had papers. We weren't looking at TV much. We were just looking at our newspapers. But I can say if everyone in the audience were on the SEPTA bus right now, they'd be scrolling on their phones. And they will probably see two years ago or how many ever years ago a tweet or an Instagram post about Trayvon Martin or how many years ago about Eric Garner. They would have saw that post immediately. Right. Or they would saw whatever post of a black body being terrorized immediately. And probably 10, 15 years ago, you would have had to wait until it got in the newspaper, if it got in the newspaper. So it was just in our face more, and it's terrible. I just think, um, like, like, like Chris said, I just think that they use social media to distract the youth because, like you say, on the SEPTA bus, only thing you see is people on their phones, people playing music. Like, people don't even talk no more. Mm -hmm. But the crazy thing about it is, like, if you go to, like, a different community, 
and like once you see a black brother, you're gonna speak to him, but if you were in the black community, you don't speak to him. I just wanna know like why though, mm -hmm. why it's like that. One thing I've noticed that stands in the way of a lot of success for young black males, I think is a lack of motivation, right? Do you believe that the history of slavery um, in legal segregation and the way people viewed us during that time has an effect on how young black men view themselves now? Do you believe that they have maybe low self-esteem? Yes, I, I've had low self-esteem. Low, low self um, I have high self-esteem now, I'm not being arrogant, but self-esteem is extremely high. But I would have low self-esteem if I lived and I grew up in an urban community and I heard gunshots very often and I heard police sirens very often and I knew my first cousin got shot or my first cousin was doing a 15 year sentence or my, my cousin or my brother got beat by the police or my sister got beat by the police. I would have low self-esteem because I would think would well, this happen to me or I was constantly failing in school to make it less extreme. So I would, my self-esteem would be extremely low. Um. I think that if we look at education as a whole um, and how education is structured in order to privilege a certain voice, you know, that voice being white, the white population, right? So it's, it's no, it's no um, stretch of the imagination to understand that just by you coming to school that first day, you know, you are now having to internalize you know, what it means to be a black person mm -hmm. in this white institution. And so I don't think um, that um, that makes it easy for young black people to value themselves. Do you think the media plays a major role in um, the types of stereotypes that are perpetuated? Because I hear a lot of times, um, or I've read articles, and it seems that maybe young black boys are treated differently than maybe another little white boy in the school or from what they see on television, they don't see m many images of themselves or proud images of you know, strong black men or successful black men. Do you feel that that has something to do with the way that they view themselves as well? Yes. Um, as a dean of students, I, I'm embarrassed to say, but I suspended about, on average, six boys a day. I didn't teach at an all-boys school, but I suspended about six a day. If I can do the math, six times five, that's 30 a week. And it was for very minute things. If I were to elbow nudge you in the hallway, I'm getting suspended for a day. That's one day I lose my education. And like she said, my education is targeted or it's a narrow view and it's toward the white male. But if I was in a suburban school and that elbow nudge was something I saw in the hallway was something reported to me, that wouldn't be a suspension. Right. So I, I think, yes. Mm -hmm. So again, I just want to say that like history teaches us a lot, right? And entertainment in this country for us, mm -hmm. or even for whites, right? It started with like, well, maybe it didn't start there, but if we think about minstrelsy and things like that, how were we, how were we viewed? What images were you know broadcast for other people to be entertained Sambo, by? All of right, them, yeah. right. Sambo, Jezebel, Mammy, mm -hmm. you know, all of that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, does that affect how we see ourselves? Does that affect how we behave? Mm -hmm. Of course it does, yeah. and we still watch it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. So, now, do you have something to say for that, Sarah? I mean, we go all day. Um, <laughs> the low self-esteem really came from the father not being in the household, and I'm gonna be serious about that. Okay. Because it's like, it's important. you look up to your mom, but you're a male. You can't do what your mom do right. if you're a male. Mm -hmm. um, another thing when it comes to the media, they don't pit positive black TV shows on TV no more. Like, often, yeah. Off, I mean, there's, there's but we don't watch you know, them either. Because we have blackish, <laughs> right? And then you'll say to kids, black you watch blackish? No, but they'll watch Empire. What does Empire right. promote? Like I had right. sex, so. yeah. drugs. And I have, um, I had a student, uh, his birthday was a Sunday. He was like, yeah, Mr. Willis, when I'm going to see Barbershop, why? Barbershop, y'all talking about empire, loving hip hop. Why do, why do parents think it's cool to be your kid's friend? And then when they get 13, 14, 15, they disrespect you. I don't know what's gotten into them. You've been their friend since they were little. Right. That's your fault. Now, I kind of want to talk about the needs of young black males today. Um, obviously, I'm a woman, you know, God created me in, in that fashion, but sometimes I sit back and I think, you know, are the needs of black men being met? 
And what are those needs? Or do we have it all misconstrued? Are we not going about this the right way? Yeah. What do you think are the needs of black men? I mean, today there's a, there's a, a, a scale. Okay. There's not one mm -hmm. or two or 20 things that black men need. There's different type of black males. Yeah, so they all need different things, but they're all not met. met. Probably. So what about, what, let me be more specific. Them. Let's talk about inner city black youth. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that because at what they call at risk, you know, what, what do you think? You work in these schools. What do you I think do. are their needs? What are you seeing uh, that, that are not being met? So a lot of them, yes, they, we, a lot of them live in single parent homes. Okay. A lot of them aren't um, brought up well. Um, what, is, what does it mean to be brought up well? It's a very difficult question, but I'm going to kind of ignore it, but answer at the same time. Um, they live in homes where they have to, if they're 13, raise their 10-year-old brother or sister because their mom <coughs> works probably two miles from New York and she lives in Camden, which is right over the bridge. So they're not doing their homework and because they have to put some hot plate in the microwave, some $2 meal they got from the corner store. So it's a lot they have to do, and they, they have their brain racked, and they think they're an adult, and they're only 12 years old. So, so basically, they're really suffering from neglect, I would say, one of the things that's happening. Yes, but the definition of neglect, their mom probably wouldn't. I wouldn't wanna, say wouldn't, that. Wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't <laughs> say that they're suffering from <laughs> neglect. Their mom wouldn't want to put themselves yeah. in, that, mm -hmm. um, in that category because she's trying to bring the money home, and she thinks that's most important. For herself, I, I don't. But if there's no food in the house and you're hungry and all you do is eat it, because there are some students that I know for a fact that they only get their meals at school. Some that's a students, form of neglect. Some of my students are those. You know, students. that but is because you have to take that. That's yeah. along the guidelines. My, our parents in that situation depend on the school to be fed and be taught because of their situation. Okay. All right. So, what do you think? What's the kind of spin off of that? What do, what do you think about needs? The needs of young um, black boys today. Sometimes, and just like Chris said, I think it is neglect because sometimes it don't always have to be about. Well, Chris like, said it's not neglect. So oh, it's not. He doesn't want to use that I word. Apologize. I use that word because. Oh, you use. I'm sorry. Like y'all. Like, I'm trying to think. Um, <laughs> I try to think what y'all saying. Um, I think it is neglect because sometimes, like, we have parents like they um, rely on the teacher to be their parent, their brother, their sister, whatever, just because they don't have time for it. And like sometimes you do have. A parent that works from um, seven in the morning to like ten at night, like so they barely see their kids. Sometimes they don't even check their homework. I have some parents that do their kids' homework, and it's like. But if um, not to um, make this a debate, but but if we can go by the phrase, it takes a village. It takes a village. I, we can, as educators in the school, people in the community, we can meet that um, role of being an educator, being a um, parent, being a big brother. And then that kid, and I have one particular kid in mind, that kid that comes to um, school and walks through the threshold of my classroom mm -hmm. feels like he's back home again, or he feels like he's at his second home. Right. And when he goes home, he's like, ah, I can do my homework here, and then I can't wait to go to sleep and get back to go to school again. Mm -hmm. And now his life is not all good, but it's a little bit better because he has that brother to go home to. He has that um, sister or older mom or cousin to go home to. And that, that environment, what, where he's running from, he runs to the school for the, for that safety. Okay. So as a parent, okay, <laughs> I think I'm a little. Um, I, in, in one way, I'm a little offended by the whole neglect thing, but I think it's because I'm idealistic about our community, and and I just got to be honest. Um, and I have a ten year old son. I am a single parent. You know, I'm, I'm in grad school. I have two jobs. So do I do I see my son as much as I would like to? No. Um, does that mean that I'm a neglectful parent? No. Um, you know, I think that there are many a parent who, you know, have to rely on grandparents, who have to rely on siblings. Um, I am one of those. Um, so I just, but there are. But, but there I think are, we're not talking about those situations. Mm -hmm. I think we're talking about parents who, you know, don't leave food in the house, parents who are constantly on social media, not yeah. going to school meetings. I mean, we have meetings and parents yeah. don't come unless we offer food. That's what I'm are talking there, about. Are yeah. there like an overwhelming, or is, yes, is there that, is. do y'all yeah. want to yes, say? It is. Yes, there is it an is. overwhelming amount of I mean, people like that. Uh, and, yeah. and, and we're not and saying that's, is that person. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, saying I, obviously. Parent. However, but what because I'm just saying is, when I was teaching, you know, um, so I, I'm a math teacher also, and, and I can't say that I would, 
the, and this is just my experience, and maybe it, bec it was because I was at a, a school that was not necessarily just a neighborhood school, you know, high school of the future. It's a different set of kids there. Um, you know, so that wasn't my experience is right. what I'm saying. Exactly. That's and it. from working in, in the community, uh, in a promise zone, if you guys don't know what promise zones are, Barack Obama, you know, mm -hmm. he labeled uh, at-risk communities with drugs and violence at um, promise zones. I work in a promise zone for about five years, and I see some of the same trends, a lot of trends. I see some of the same behaviors of when tax time comes out, what they're purchasing. I see that we'll have meetings, and they're not coming to those yeah. meetings. They're not concerned. We have to have mm -hmm. food. Yeah. I see we're not, we're, there's, there are different types of parenting, of course. No, we don't think if you get help from your family, that's neglect. But certain things are neglect. If your kid doesn't have, has sneakers on that are too small for their feet and they've been wearing it for over a year and you have new, new clothes on and new shoes, that's neglect. If oh, your yeah, child is constantly <laughs> hungry and stealing food and putting in a backpack to take home, that's neglect. So we're talking about the, the, what they call neglect, what you would have to call child services for, neglect. And, and quite frankly, a lot of African-American boys are neglected in, in, one, in, a, in, in a way, I I'm going to kind of move on to the next topic. One way of neglect, I think, is leadership. You know, let's talk about the lack of leadership in our communities, okay? Do you guys feel like there's a crisis um, among minority male leadership? Do you feel like we don't have enough, enough of that to go around? Or when people are not just stepping up to the place to be mentors or, like you talked about, fathers not being in a home. Do you think that's one of the issues that we're having? I would go with the or. Um, a lot of us aren't stepping up, and I'm saying us as me, myself. Um, the lack of leaders, I would say no, lack of, le lack of leadership. When I think of lack of leadership, I would think about Martin Luther King, Huey P, Malcolm X, and those guys. Mm -hmm. And they were like leading the nation when it comes to trying to uplift black people. Right. But we have so many knowledgeable black men that we all just need to like just grab a youngin in the street if we see him like with their pants down or not with their pants down, but doing the wrong thing. Right. And we need to just yeah, let me, let me talk to you for a second. We can do that instead of driving by or walking by and like tweeting like, these young bulls, knuckleheads out here. Most of us probably do that. I've done it myself. Okay. You, you have something um, to say about leadership? Like, who are the kids looking up to today? I mean, today? prime example, Meek Mills. Um, but I think, I mean, we can step up, but sometimes I'm not, I'm not going to say it's hard, but it's like when you, when you tell a young bull something like, they get smart, like, you ain't my dad, you ain't okay. my brother, who are you, old head? Like, so, I mean, it's like, do we really want to do that? Like, for real. Maybe it's not, but do you want to? Because you did, because you started to. It's about how do we do it, right? Yeah, it's like how, how, yeah. how can I? How can I relate to this young boy? How can, I, how can I let them know that maybe being on the streets is not what's hot, or, you know, listening to this isn't the best thing for them, or making this decision? You know, how do you provide leadership to your youth? Um, so, I look up to Meek. Okay. Probably, he was probably younger than me, I can say that for a fact. But the like, rapper? Yes. I don't know okay. anybody else named me. Um, I have to be clear. No, I'm not saying you. you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, my God. They, they my man, up, don't, man. don't, don't start saying that she don't. You can't um, finish. No, no, explain. It's okay. Like, it's the I'm open really forum. Up so up to me. No, um, <laughs> I'm just that annoying. I, every time I'm on my way to work, I'm listening to his song, Check, and then I keep going, Dreams and Nightmares. But because, not the same way, but they mo his, his songs motivate the kids to do whatever they want to do, and it motivates me to do whatever I need to do. I'm How? getting a check, 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 okay. check, check. Wait, wait. You disagree. Oh, wait. How? Now tell me why you disagree. How? Because How? me came from a, a place where he didn't see no way out, and now he's at this place. Yes, he's going backward and backward, but he's, he keeps bouncing back. See? And I, I, didn't, I didn't come from that place, me? but his, his momentum and his movement that he grew from, we can, tell, we can tell that message to younger people, no, don't go down that road, don't go hand in hand on your corner and everything like that, but if you wanna make a dollar, if you wanna do this, but you gotta do this to be successful, just like he did, not the same way, but you gotta do what you gotta do to get where you wanna get. But you just said okay. you look up to him. Yeah, I'm not gonna to try to do what he wanna do, but I look but up to that movement, he, no. Created. Yes. I want, yes. I dream chasers. That's 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 a good name. But listen, you, you had, first of all, this is the guy that raps about killing people, and then he want to say, "Oh, too many killings going on in my city." You rap about it. You're not even making sense. So you're not so making there's sense. There's a lot of contradiction going on. Yeah, a lot of talking contradiction. about leaders. You're not and also, let's sense. talk about. Like, I would never call him a leader, though. But that's why I said. Who are these kids? Because that's like, that's the the youth's leadership, you know. So when we talk about people like you know like Bill Cosby, for instance, you know, that was a leader to us. 
You know, and so there was a contradiction there. You know, but in the same, um, in the same, on the same tongue, I would say I look up to Lil Wayne. Okay. Yo, boy, you going crazy I, today. No, <laughs> you going crazy. I'm not going to walk, I'm not, I'm not walk in the streets with Lil Wayne and say, this is my dog. But if I li listen to his lyrics, some of his songs, I'm like, maybe, I you feel know like I think dying. Is, maybe there's a... Nah, not that song. Be, maybe but maybe you because he's... Turn, a, he's like, he, okay, it's different because you're educated, so you kind of know what to filter out, right? Yes. And I, but I they don't, right? So that's what we're saying. So they don't. So really, truly, should they be really listening to these people? No, and I wouldn't tell him, like, I wouldn't okay. sit a black boy next to me and say, this, these are the people to look up to. Okay. But I will turn on a Meek song, and I would turn to a turn about on Lil Wayne song and say, how can Nas, we analyze 19, these lyrics, 17. and how can we... Let's be respectful now. How can we analyze these lyrics and how can we live through this song? How can we live through polos and shell tops? Right. With, um, Meek Mills is talking we, about. We still have to relate. So I, I understand from Chris' perspective, we can't just shut it all the way down. Because no. this is what they're listening to. Like, so we kind of have to find, find a way to kind of speak their language. Can so. I say so that me. I look up to their positive messages? Some of, some of them. I don't look but up listen. to their life. Okay, okay. All right, all right. Go I have, I'm sorry. I have like... I used to mentor North Philadelphia. The zip code my school is in is the, one of the top 10 worst zip codes in the country. Now, I have middle schoolers that just want to ride dirt bikes all day long. They don't want to do nothing else. What Meek Mill really do? Yes, he donated coats from Reebok, which Rick Ross was sponsored by. We don't know if he actually paid for those coats. They could have been free. My fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha, we donate every year. Okay. If you're getting so much money that you claim you get, do something else. Build a rec center. Right. That's why I don't look up to him. Okay. But if you turn, if you can turn on a he, Meek Mill song and sit a youngin next to you, and then that youngin start to talk about his life through that Meek Mill song, you get you bridge that gap between you and the youngin. I'm, I'm talking about. I understand that, it. I know what you're that saying. Thing. I'm not looking. I'm not looking okay. up to um, okay. Meek Mill. All right. Like, Thank you so much. Okay. I want to hang up. Hang out with that man. Go ahead. I'm Thank sorry. you. I understand. I understand <laughs> from both of your perspectives. I definitely understand. Thank you guys. How do you feel being in the middle of these these gentlemen? It's fire. It's so hot though. Okay. I mean, his song. Right. I'm keeping the yes. peace. It's okay. It's okay, guys. We're gonna talk about education. Let's talk a little about education. Did you guys know that? <laughs> By their mid thirties, um, six in ten African American boys have dropped out of school and spent some time in prison. Six out of ten. What is that? What is that? When you hear a statistic like that, what does that make you feel? Like, how does that make you feel? Six out of ten. By the mid thirties, spent dropped out of high school, spent some time in prison. It it makes me cringe and it, it stings because I I used to educate high school dropouts for a few years before I became a um, dean of students and a teacher. At Freedom Prep Charter School, I worked at um, Youth Build Philly Charter School. Okay. Most of my black male students, no, less than half of my black male students were in and out of jail that same year that they were supposed to graduate. Some didn't graduate because they were um, arrested. Okay. Um, I can remember one of my students exactly, he didn't call his mom, he didn't call his dad, he didn't call his uncle, he called me the morning, like 10 o'clock. I can remember that exact moment, like, Mr. Chris, I just got locked up. And he was like, I, I don't. No, what's what's he was like, with this? I, I need bail money. I was like, I, can you? I was like really stuck, but it, I was stuck on emotion. I was stuck on like, how can I help this kid? And right. I was stuck on like, what did you do to get yourself in this situation? Mm -hmm. But I, it was like, I thought about the whole time I like spent educating these young black men is like, I think about the trap that they're stuck in. Okay. The web. Okay. Well, I so, I just what I'm thinking of is how all of this is connected, right? So, okay. image um, is connected to your question now. So, uh, and I'm thinking about things that we hear a lot about. We we hear a lot about, um, you know, the achievement gap, and and then you know, uh, then we hear about how there are so many black people or black students or young black boys who are disproportionately being suspended or being disciplined within the school. And if you flip that, those are two sides like of the same coin. Right. So how can we connect the two, right? We see that these same students who are disciplined disproportionately um, then spend time out of school, right? Which right. affects their academic performance. They're, then they're behind. Right. They so they can't catch they're up. being pushed out. Yeah, pretty much. And why are they being pushed out? It's connected to test scores also. So now we push out the people that are not so performing well. Right? Darwin. Right. Evolution. So, I mean, but it all, it, it, it can be connected to identity. Yeah. It can be connected to how these young men see themselves. And, and what is their place in society, really? Like, 
does does America, does society have a place for them, really? Because like, like some people say, like if all black men just woke up tomorrow and said, I'm gonna go get a job, I'm gonna go be successful, Will we receive them as such? Will we open our arms? Do, are does, there jobs for are them? Are there jobs for them? <laughs> there are jobs, but are they for them? You know? I mean, so I just want to say one more thing in regards to that, you know, that um, in relation to this growth, this, this rapid growth of the prison industrial complex, you know, um, that did not grow at the same time that there was a high increase in crime. Mm -hmm. So why did it grow? Why, why, what happened there? There was a there was a yeah. a shift in 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 social right. um, in that aspect, mm -hmm. right? And so, therefore, it was noted that these these people, there's no place for them. So, what do we do with them? We criminalize them. We jail them. Right, right. I want to ask, why is it that you think that there are more African Americans in special education today than any other race? Because I mean, come on, let's be honest. What, and, take, and, and labeled as ADHD yeah. or this or that. That's what it is. Um, being a special education teacher, I struggle with it and okay. I, I ponder with it because I started off teaching as a co-teacher in a self-contained special education, okay. special education classroom, and most of my students were black males. And some of them were very, 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 very smart. Not very smart, what am I doing? But they were, they were academically, academically low but they didn't need to be in that self-contained self classroom. Yeah. But once they became, once they got into that self-contained classroom. It brought them down. Yes. And then they started, started to reversed. display some, um, some negative. Some characteristics. Yes, yes. So it's a downward spiral that it goes into. And then you become that, that one student that just displays so many negative behaviors. You get so low academically and you start to fit in this one box. Now you're just pushed along. Right. And you're still on that same grade level that you were on. No child left behind. Did Can't it do leave us behind. A, did it do us a disservice, perhaps? Yes. Yes. Okay. I have a um, I have a student in fifth grade that's on a first and second grade reading level. I can't help him much if I don't stay after school. If I if he doesn't stay after if he doesn't stay after school with me. But there's no time for him to stay after school with me for for me to teach him how to read. And I'm not talking about reading a book one-on-one -on -one with him, but I got to teach him sight words oh, yeah. and I got to teach him yeah, so many other things other than flipping pages in the book. But he's in fifth grade going to sixth grade on a first and second reading level. So what can we do there? I think that one thing that we can do as, as people in the community, as leaders in the community, is that we can help parents to advocate for themselves. Um, help parents to know what their rights are in regards to their children being labeled, right? That's, that's the agency that we have. And as a young parent, I can say, I, I had my daughter when I was 14. And so until she was darn near getting out of high school, um, I didn't know how to speak up for her as a parent. And that's what we have in our community. We have young people who are raising children yeah. who feel like this institution of schooling is the end all be all. They have the last say and we have the last say. These, these are yeah. our children. You got to advocate yeah. for your children. Yeah. So if I can take a few steps back, back okay. a little bit, Thank that's you. why I wouldn't want to put parents, especially um, parents in an um, urban community, in the box of neglect. They're, most of the time they're not educated on what, they, what their rights are, what they need to do, what they can do, and things like that. Yes, I hate it when I had to um, call a parent for a suspension and they got the voicemail, phone didn't work, or they just didn't want to come up for a reinstatement meeting. Or now they don't want to come up to the IEP meeting and they, they say, um, you have my signature over the phone or other things like that. I'm so uncomfortable with IEPs because I feel that it also cripples some of our parents. Oh, um, and, and they begin to tell their kids, this has happened in front of my face. When I know it's, it was a lack of motivation, the parent will come in and say, well, you know she got an IEP. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what does that mean? I understand that an IEP is what a yeah. file, you know, I haven't really worked with IEPs and it kind of, you know. So an individual, right. individual right. Um, education plan. So to see where you are, maybe what, are your, what do you need, <laughs> you kind of special, if you're special needs or things like that. But some of it sometimes, it's just a lack of motivation. So if we're going to use it as a crutch, then you just need the IEP for everything. Oh, he doesn't have a job because you know he has IEP. Hmm. What do we do? How do we like, how do we really give them the help that they need so they can transition from out without feeling like they have to. Well, they don't. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, 
I was just going to be just real quick just to let you know okay. the reason why they pay black boys IEP. Okay. Because you get more money than a regular student. That's why they do it. That's why they try to keep you in there because they get more money. From the from state? You. Yes, from the state versus oh. someone that doesn't have an IEP. Because a lot more kids are being, having That's IEPs why. nowadays. That's why they don't, they don't never want to get you out. Okay. Especially if your parent is not like aware of oh. or educated. And, and then they, the parents can get a check also, I yes, think, right? Yes, they also get a so, check. And then also, no, not because of the IEP. Um, yeah, I, I've heard that. I think it, I've heard it, depends. it depends. It depends the on the case. Like <laughs> it depends on the case. Not like not, not everyone, but not some everyone, but can, some can. It helps their case to get like oh, you know, some oh, assistance. Okay, yeah. okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah. Okay. So before we move on to the next topic, I want to kind of ask you guys: What do you think we can do to motivate young black boys to um, become more successful in school today? What What are we missing? What are, What are we? What are educators like not doing? I think it comes from the top in schools, but. I mean, we're so far from the top, I don't want to speak on it, but I will. Mm -hmm. We need more black educators in school. Okay, diverse education, mm -hmm. kids, educators. Little black kids in school need to know what it looks like to be a black professional, a, a black educator. Mm -hmm. not, a, um, not a person in a classroom that you cannot relate to, but they're teaching you some type of thing that you don't even relate to. So one, you can't relate to the person that's teaching you something that you can't relate to. And, but I try to be the funniest and most energetic person in the classroom, and my, my kids love it. And I, I, I do it for them to see. Like, hey, a black man can be this quirky and funny and silly, and yes, I don't look like that black male that you see every day walking to school. Right. But they also they need but to see still, that it still helps for them to connect with somebody that looks like them. Yes, that black woman in the classroom as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, that's why I came back to Philadelphia when I was in D.C. Making money, living my little fabulous life. I'm like, this isn't right. I have to come back. You have to see that you can leave Philadelphia and come back and help your community. You have to stand before them and say, hey, I'm a Howard graduate, but look, we're gonna get to work. I'm here for you. You know, like it means nothing. I'm just a, just another person who made it out at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you think? So I mean I agree with right I think I, I agree with both of you you know I, I definitely think that one thing that I will say is that um, yes they need to see educators that look like them that's true you don't have to look like them in order to connect with them though um, I think that we have to be real as educators and um, okay. like one thing I like that, that. yeah I yeah. think one thing that people used to tell me you know oh make sure you when you go in the classroom you know never show them who you really are you know never let them see this 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 real personality you know because then then they take uh, liberties with you yeah. and it's like yeah no that didn't work <laughs> I think that you know you when I boundaries you yeah, know? yeah when I couldn't get a control of my class and Chris knows like I would throw on a rap song like okay y'all not listening let's let's look at this video I would get their attention we would talk about it how it relates to their you know to them to their lives all right now let's get back to work you know, like that's that you you have and then to. And they're like, "Oh, Miss Rooney, she listened to that." Yeah. You know, so it's kind of like, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if I listened to it, but, <laughs> but I just put it on. So, go ahead, Shane. Um, what do you think about when it comes to motivating our youth? What do you think that we can do to we, help motivate them? We really them? need um, black schools, to be honest. Okay. Black teachers. That's yes. That's one thing. But at the end of the day, we don't create the curriculum. Okay. Comes from the top. Okay, it definitely the curriculum and, it plays a big yeah. deal. Programming, yeah. yeah. And um, the kids know, like, first of all, the test be biased. It's like these kids don't know nothing that be on a test no. at all. The SATs, I was like, please, what? SATs, yeah, PSSA. That was a circling thing. After a while, I was like, I don't know this. Because yeah. <laughs> education became a money scam. It's money. That's the that's the problem. It's money. So we got to go back to being more, I guess, cur curriculum focused, child focused versus money focused, right? Yes. Can that happen? Mm. I don't know. No. We're gonna move along to our last topic I wanna talk about. I wanna talk about a little bit about poverty as it relates to violence, okay? So I went to go see Bernie Sanders speak, um, you know, just to see you know, what he had to say. And one of the things that stood out to me was that he um, said that Youth ages 17 to 20, to 20 um, male African American youth, um, over 51% are unemployed. That is a major issue. 
So what do you? What is the connection um, that joblessness has on violence and crime in America? That's a um, that's an interesting question, but I first think of if you don't have any, if you don't have anything to do, you're bored and you're just gonna look for something to do, and you're that young, living in the type of community you live in, the things you're introduced to, the things you're usually around, mm -hmm. it's probably violence and crime and drugs, and you're just gonna go out mm -hmm. and. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead no, what was the ages you said again? 17? Like 17 to 20. And I think it's even higher uh, because, I mean, I see a, a lot of young people today, they graduate from high school, they go to these elaborate proms, but then they just go home. And there's no yeah. future. There's nothing. Seven, 18 goes by. 19 is going by. 20 is going by. 21 is going by. 22. No job. Just outside. Yeah. Um, I think it also plays a part of, like, what they did in high school. Because to be honest, like, you have, like, kids, black males showing up to interviews with, like, not the proper stuff on. Like, you got jeans on, cut-up jeans, sneakers on. Like, that's the thing. It's like, we need to do a better job with, like... Of getting actually, them ready. Actually getting them ready. Yeah, so work readiness, in a sense. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about future readiness, we also talk about work readiness, work prep. And I think that um, a lot of schools today, that's like a class that they just skip. They don't even mm -hmm. have, they, don't, they probably don't even have a class on how to properly dress um, for success or, you know, how to do a resume, um, how to properly maybe even speak. Because sometimes, yeah. I, my students, well, I'm not changing who I am, but I'm yeah. like, it's not changing who you are. You know, it's about, you know, having the right tools for, you know, where you're going. You know, you wouldn't go to a to play baseball with a football, right? So, yeah. you know, you have to speak and carry yourself in the manner of the setting of where you're going. You say um, baseball, playing baseball or football, I think you you just have to play the game. And, and that's the game, yeah. They don't, they're, they're not taught how to play the game. Yeah. No. Um, Is that on purpose? They're yes. purposely not taught? Yeah. I mean, of course. Of course, right, yeah. Um, but I thought, I think about the high school students I used to teach, they were 18 to 21, and their biggest accomplishment in life they were looking forward to just like this is their high school graduation and this is where they stopped. It wasn't, I'm going here. Yeah. I can't wait to get here. Sir. And go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, you <clears throat> finish that thought. They weren't taught for so many years to get past there because their mother, their father, their the people around them, they dropped out of school. And they wanted to do so much better than their high their um the people around them. So um, hopefully I can remember what I was thinking of saying, but I, I basically want to connect that to um, what jobs they're eligible for, right? Okay. So based on that age bracket, and, and I don't want to project this image of what this sweeping generalization, but what I will say is that there are many black men that have records, right? But why? You know, we look at in this, in this city, in Philadelphia, where stop and frisk happens, right? And where black and Latino males are, you know, stop and frisk, over 80% of all the stop and frisk in Philadelphia mm -hmm. are black mm -hmm. and Latino males, right? So therefore, we, we see them being connected with the criminal justice system um, even more, right? And anyway, so you, you can find a reason if you find something that they have done or something that they have or whatever, right? Now they have a record. Mm -hmm. So now what jobs are they eligible for? Exactly. All right. So I'm just going to wrap this up. Um, when you hear names like Eric Garner, um, placed in a chokehold by police officers for about 15 to 19 seconds while being arrested, Trayvon Martin, 17 year old fairly shot by a neighborhood watch volunteer in Florida because he had on a hoodie and Skittles in pocket. Michael Brown, 18-year-old fatally shot by the white officer in Ferguson, Missouri. Freddie Gray, 25-year-old Baltimore native, died under mysterious circumstances after being arrested by police. Tam Tamir Rice, 12-year-old in Cleveland, Ohio, reported to have a gun and was shot twice by cops and died the following day. How does that make you feel? I'm gonna tell you, I have grappled with this because I get tired of explaining this to my boy. Mm -hmm. like. Tired. I cry. I'm scared as a parent 
you know, like when you look at what can happen to them when they're not in your care, mm -hmm. you know, as, as a mother, I mean. Okay. Let me take one more comment from each of you and then we're gonna go to the audience questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead, you got it. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So when I think about those lists, those names, those names just you, hearing um, what happened, those things. Over. I think about um, Abdul Latif, who's a, who was a student of mine. I think about Aeneas Clanton, who, the student who called me on the phone when he was arrested. Um, and I think about myself. Abdul, I would think about him because one story, he was running to school. Yes, yes. He was running to school and um, the police officers were chasing him down the street. And I greeted the scholars when they um, got into the school. And they thought he was running from the police. They, he thought, they thought he was doing something wrong. So they chased him all the way up five flights of stairs, and they pinned him to our director of student's life's desk and to take him out in cuffs. He did nothing wrong. He was just running to school because he was late. And that, that, that whole day just tore me apart, just like when I hear these people's names. It's just, every time I hear their names, it just tears me apart. Okay. One last word, Shane? Um, like, those names just really break my heart because... Actually, today I had a second grader bring a BB gun to school and like Tamir uh, Rice. It's just, it just really hurt and just like, just the note in Philadelphia, we get targeted black males. Like I got stopped at 17 and Walnut for just blowing my horn and the cop jumped out the car with a gun thinking I stole the car. And it's like, even if I stole the car, that still doesn't give you the right to pull your gun out on me. And then when I showed him my stuff, he let me go and say, have a nice night. So. It just really breaks my heart that, like, and you being treated like this. Him. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, I mean, there's so much more to talk about. I mean, you're going to join us for part two. But right now, we're going to go into the audience and see what our audience has to say about the topic. I want to know, do you guys think that the, um, the difference in respect from back then to now has changed the way young men um, treat one another as well as, you know, their peers, you, you know, you as adults? Because I will say that a lot has changed since then. Before adults could check you, now parents get rowdy with adults for checking their kids. I don't know. I didn't live back then. I won't say it, it changed, but it is. I would say that is it's kind of bad. Like you said, like a parent would check you for checking their child. If I was out in the street walking on 17th and Walnut, and a little kid just bumped me or he was like harassing a, a young girl and I said, young and chill out. And his mom just, or his dad wrote, I'm like, talk to my kid for, who you? And I'm like, my bad, I'm just, just mm -hmm. tripping. I just stepped back, but he probably would have respected I was checking his son 30 years ago, like right. you're saying. Okay, all right, does anybody else wanna take that, that, in, that question? I mean, I think uh, I don't. I, I I don't have to say about sixty years ago or fifty years ago in my lifetime. Yes, it has changed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the the music and just the culture in general that because we don't control the images that are projected to us that we consume, right? Um, then uh, how we act then is really just a mirror of mm -hmm. how we're being, or, or, or the image that other people have of us. And being projected you, you, to You us. follow what I'm saying? Because yeah. yeah. sometimes it doesn't come out properly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, also, I also think like what I said basically earlier about like how uh, the parent and the child are like friends. So it's like, don't ever check my child. That's, that, that's like they're friends. So they're not gonna believe whatever you say. That's my friend. No, they can never do no wrong. That's my child. Like, so. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. And we get to the next question. Hello, how are you? Hey, thank you for coming on the show. Yes. Hey. What's your name? Uh, my name is Keith Johnson. Okay, Keith. Um, what do you have to say today? Uh, I got a lot to say. Um, I actually enjoyed, uh, you know, coming. I enjoyed you. everyone's input. Mm -hmm. um, so where? You mind if I hold it? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, so when exactly does ownership come into play? Because I hear a lot of this and the system did that, but where does ownership of uh, a person come into play? Today. Um, but oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. If, so if I walked out of this building and I, so this is completely hypothetical. Right. Do not pick up your cell phones and call the police on me. But if I had a few dime bags of crack in my, my suit jacket and I got arrested, I would say, like, why did cops harass me outside when I'm just walking down the street by my lonely and just 
I'm peaceful. I don't. I have no reason. But but, but crack is illegal. Yes, that's why I said today. It only I I still blame myself for being arrested. I shouldn't have that in my pocket. Yeah. So. But the fact that you even are suspect yeah. to begin with, yes. you could have had just candy in your yes. pocket, right? So what I will he say had the in, crack regards, in, his in regards right. to ownership, right. right? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I got to be careful of this as, as an educator also because I, I'm like a big mama bear. Like, no, you know, you don't do this to, to my kids, you know, because they all my kids, right? Um, but what I will say is how I raise my own child and therefore how I have to instruct my students, right? is that they do have to own how they behave. Do we have to um, assimilate to white culture? No. No. That's the problem there. Matter of fact, a little bit more. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think that uh, with ownership comes, uh, we need to stop being victims. And that's what I feel like. Uh, the culture, yeah, we need to regain our power. I agree. Because uh, as a black male, like I've been in all aspects of society. I've been out with people who I actually known who've murder people mm -hmm. and I've also been with uh, African Americans who are making millions of dollars mm -hmm. and as friendly as ever. Mm -hmm. So uh, like, I, I feel like we need to stop being victims yeah. and really un and empower ourselves and empower our children and just say like look even society does have it in for you but if you do what you're supposed to do mm -hmm. it's higher it's the more likely that you will succeed and you will bypass all those issues. Can we? Can as we, a group, as a whole? Can some, we no, just, some, some, but not all. Need, but it makes group, it a lot easier. Can we do that as a group? I, I, I must ask a question. Can, okay. we, can we be empowered and can we stop being victims if we're constantly victimized? Mm. Look, I, well. If, if I, I, well, hold on now. <laughs> no, no, I have to. 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 I have to because it Wait, doesn't. You didn't let me answer. The I'm question. sorry. We but, gotta move on to the next person. I know. I'm sorry. I have to. I have to, because it doesn't make a difference if I'm walking around the streets with a big hoodie on, my pants sagging, and looking like I'm about to rob a house, mm -hmm. and I'm walking in a suit. The cops are still harass me. It happens. We got, we got yes. people speaking out of town. Yes. If it hit now, it's getting real. You, 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 you want to get something to say, bro, my brother? Oh. Hold on. Yes. Hold on. Hold on now. All right, we're gonna go to my brother over here. Yes, sir. Okay, hold on. Would you like to say something, Mr. Withers? Go ahead. Okay. Cool. You wanna say something? No, I was just going basically say it's like, the change that we had to stop impressing, I mean, try to impress the, the white people. Yeah. And just be to ourselves. Like, we, we go to them for everything. I mean, yeah. they the one that put the drugs in our community anyway. Mm -hmm. So okay. we're doing their work, right. and they're still getting paid off of right. it. Right, right, okay. Then we go to jail. They still get paid. Hello, so how are you doing today? I'm good, I'm good. My name's Travis. I really got a lot to say, but oh. I'm gonna try to keep it uh, okay. I'm gonna try to keep it short. Because I mean every topic that they discussed up there, they really go all hand in hand if you really look at it from okay, the prison system to education to us. Like they said, like every member on the panel, they said they upset about the children, well our young black men who got murdered by, you know, mm -hmm. a white cop or whatever. That's an issue. Right. We kill each other every day okay. over nothing, and that's not an issue. Mm -hmm. That's the point that bothers me. Like we all oh, yeah. The white man this, the white man that. Yo, we killing each other though. But nobody out here with the marching on that, nobody. But again, that goes to all of that from the TV, like the sister said, when you see it, people don't really understand. Like if you see that all the time, that's all you see yourself. That's what you think you are. Mm -hmm. But again, somebody else control that. Mm -hmm. And then if they projecting it to our babies, our kids, that's all they gonna think. Like they were talking about Meek Mill. I wouldn't say he's a, the, the right person to be about because again, the things he talks about, that's why little boys and girls are going to jail. Right. Yeah, I'm slinging crack, I'm doing it. Oh, that's cool, that's cool, I can do that. Nah, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. You understand, like, and that's the problem. We have to take accountability for ourselves, mm -hmm. our people. Mm -hmm. And the actions that we have. Oh, all that. We have to, we have to. It starts with us, and it also starts with self-love, though. We don't love it, we don't love each other. We want to be like everybody else instead of us. But, but how can we, how can we, us. how can they start to love each, love themselves? How can young black men start to love themselves? It starts at home, it starts with your neighbor, it starts at school, it starts with the teachers. Mm -hmm everything but again there's so many other things going against us but that doesn't mean that that has to defeat us though okay. but again like they said we got to go back to being with us because before there was the civil war and you know the whites had them we had each other maybe we can have it maybe there needs to be a re um a re-emergence of a movement but with young people today you know young minorities but the thing about the movement people scared to step out in the forefront you know why they scared to step out in the forefront because when you step out in the forefront they get rid of you Okay. Look at all our leaders that we did have. Mm -hmm. Everybody stepped up to the police. They wanted to do it. They added. Together, young people, they make a 
difference, okay? Oh, thank well, you so much. Thank yeah. you so much. Could we I, have one more. So have for one more question. Could I touch okay. one? Could I, could I touch? Just no, touch. We, we, I'm going to no, tap it. I'm sorry. We, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how you doing? My name is Mel. I go by Mel Slim. Hi, hi, hi. Um, my question is basically based off of talking about the jobs um, and there not being enough jobs for people. Should we be promoting jobs or should we be capitalizing off of talent? Because if they don't have jobs, right, then I'm sure that they have God-given talents that they can use in order to bring in income. And I don't think that, and this is going to segue into my next question, which is, should we be so worried about acceptance in society or should we create our own okay. nation? Okay. All right, thank you, thank you, Mel. That's awesome. That's a very powerful system. Wait, which I, I love my, I love your fro. Okay, would you guys have anything to say to wrap this up? You guys have anything to say? I don't know how to address that question, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I do know how to address that question. And um, I, I do want to bounce it over to the artist over here, though, because I think he can address it more than I could. But I think it's. It, it will go hand in hand. Uh -huh. You get a job to finance your um, entrepreneurship and your God-given talent. They can't find jobs. So you can't, so they find, can't find jobs. They can't find and you just have sh sheer talent. How do, you, how do we teach them? How do you raise your kids? How do you provide? If my, if I had a son and he was a great drummer, he just kept banging on the dinner table. I'd get him some sticks. We'd be out here. Okay. And I would help finance his dream. Or I, I don't know. I can't so answer that question. Into I think, talents. but I think yeah. both. 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 Both, both right? But, but, we, but they don't have, they can't get the jobs. Yeah. So what you have to say, Mr. I Wilson? just think we just need to create our own jobs, to be honest, because, yeah. I mean, think about it. We pick cotton so they can sell it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. You work at a retail store so they sell it to somebody else. I mean, the, yeah. like, and we're, the, every, we're the buyers, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're the buyers. We're the largest yeah. consumers, yes. But in, in every... Ma major black company has mainly sold their company to mm. someone else. Like BET was black entertainment. It's not owned by a black company. Yeah. It's owned by Viacom, you know? So we have a lot of issues. We have a lot of things that we can say. But you know what? We have to wrap this up today. And I really had a great time with you guys today. And I really hope that we can continue this discussion on part two of America's Most Wanted, Black Man and Endangered Species. Thank you. Thank you. watching. I'll see you again next time.